Uh, my name is Dr. Nancy Coppola. I am the Chief Executive Officer and Project Director at Program Reach. Uh, we are a not-for-profit based out of the Bronx in New York, and our mission is to develop youth development programs and character development programs. We run the gamut of children from 9 to 19, teaching them self-esteem, self-respect, and how to make healthy choices. So in order to teach children how to make healthy choices, we have to have just a little bit of a background on the common mistakes that they make or the unhealthy choices that they make so we know what we need to address. Primarily, our mission when we started out was to reduce teen pregnancy and to reduce sexually transmitted infections in the teen population. 19 million children in the United States between the ages of 15 and 19 contract a sexually transmitted infection each year, so that's a lofty goal. Um, but what we found was that just addressing teen sexual activity doesn't fix the problem. There are a whole host of other behaviors that we need to address. So let's look at the unhealthy behaviors in adolescence, drugs, gangs, alcohol, violence, tobacco, and sexual activity. So that's a lot to handle. We're not just looking at sexual activity, right? Let's look at what's going on in terms of violence. These are US statistics. However, um, I have spoken across the globe, and sadly, these statistics don't vary too much from country to country. 18% um, of youth in this country, and, and this research is for the 12 to 17-year-old population. So 18% of 12 to 17-year-olds have carried a weapon to school in the 30 days prior to being interviewed for the research. 25% had been in at least one physical fight, and 10% of them had been slapped or otherwise physically abused by their boyfriend or girlfriend in the past 12 months prior to the survey. Sadly, 7% of them had been forced to have sex against their will. And in this country, we are seeing alarmingly higher rates of first initiation into sex being a violent act or a rape. 35% of them had had one alcoholic drink or more in the past 30 days, and 21% of them reported binge drinking. Remember, these are 12 to 17-year-olds, so binge drinking is five or more drinks in a row on one day. 66% um, of them had ever had at least one drink of alcohol. And in terms of drugs, it's not that much better. 23% had used marijuana at least one or more times. 6% had used cocaine. And this number, sadly, is going up because we have, once again, um, a cocaine and, and heroin epidemic in this country. And 22% of them bought their drugs on the school property. What about sex? So the media tells us that every child is having sex, right? And most high school teachers tell their kids that everyone's doing this. Um, but the truth of the matter is that only 47% of students have ever engaged in sexual activity prior to graduating from high school in the United States. Sexual activity rates across the globe, other than Amsterdam um, and parts of Germany, are consistently going down in the past 10 years. So that's a good thing but the media is not showing them that. 34% of those interviewed had had sex in the three months prior to the survey, and 22% of them were under the influence of alcohol or drugs the last time that they had engaged in sexual activity. So that's why I'm saying we have to look at the clustering of these behaviors in order to understand what's going on. So how do we address these issues the big problem is that when teens start having sex at a very young age, they continue to make unhealthy choices, um, and the number of partners goes up, and the number of cases of STIs go up, and when the number of cases of STIs go up, the big concern long-term for family stability is that the number one cause of infertility in women is having had a sexually transmitted infection or disease when you were a teenager. Okay, because we get scarring of the fallopian tubes and without going into a long anatomy and physiology lesson, when you scar those tubes, the sperm can't pass, implantation, uh, fertilization can occur. And most women do not know that they have a sexually transmitted infection or disease. So because um, part of my background in addition to being a physician is being a teacher, so if someone wants to take a guess for me, 
um, a couple of questions. What, how many sexually transmitted infections and diseases are out there now? Throw out a number. So you know there are common ones, right, that everyone knows about, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV, HPV. Give me a number. How many do we have? 130. So 20 I hear and 130, and in a way you're both right. So there are 28 specific named diseases, but some of them have 100 different variations of the virus. Okay? So 28 named diseases, and it goes up all the time. When I was in med school decades ago, we had three sexually transmitted infections and diseases. We had syphilis, we had gonorrhea, and we had what they called in those days GRID, gay-related infectious disease. Okay, so that dates me a little bit because we didn't know what AIDS or HIV was in those days because we were only seeing this new disease in the homosexual male population. So how do we prevent these unhealthy behaviors? What happens when we have these 28 sexually transmitted infections? Why are we worried? So I talked about infertility. What percentage of people who have a sexually transmitted infection are aware that they have one? What percentage of people who have a sexually transmitted infection are aware that they have one, have any symptoms at all? Hmm? 10%. So depending on the disease, um, some of them are totally asymptomatic, but it is less than 25% of people who have a sexually transmitted infection or disease will have any symptoms at all, which is why a decade after young women are infected in their teens, they are now married or in a stable relationship and trying to get pregnant, and they can't, and almost always. Better than 94% of female infertility cases are caused by some untreated sexually transmitted infection earlier in life. So how do we address these unhealthy behaviors? The first thing we need to look at is what the teens want to hear, and then the next thing we'll look at is the social science and what it tells us about how to approach these problems. So when we look at what teens need to hear, and again, these are American, uh, North American stats, so it's US and Canada combined, but it's pretty much the same globally. I, I just spoke in Trinidad a little while ago, and actually their rates were higher. 96% of teens there believe that it's important to be given a strong message from society that they shouldn't have sex until they're at least out of high school. Um, and the majority of those believe that they should be taught to delay sex until they are in a long-term, mutually monogamous, committed relationship. Because the fact of the matter is that 75% of teens who are sexually active say they regret ever having had sex. And they also say that they don't enjoy sex at that age. And it's very much true because we know that sex is more than just a physiological activity, right? It's a very emotional activity. So someone want to tell me when, and I think one of the speakers yesterday somewhere said this, when do people have the most fulfilling sex life? How long do they have to be married before they have the most fulfilling sex life? It's people who are married more than 20 years report having the most fulfilling sex lives. So without, you know, if my husband were here, were here, he might blush on this one, but I've been married almost 33 years, so life is good. <laughs> so if we want to put in place a good education program, that will teach children the skills they need to make healthy choices over the course of a lifetime so they can develop healthy relationships and have healthy marriages and have stable families. We cannot just focus on sexual activity. And yet across the globe, we hear about comprehensive sexual education programs. Most of those are run by Planned Parenthood, International Planned Parenthood, CECUS, NARAL, all those people have what they call a comprehensive sexual health education program, but the only thing they ever talk about is how to use a condom to reduce the risk of sex. Interestingly, Barna Research conducted a study just a couple of months ago asking youth who are in sex education programs across the U.S. and Canada who they feel pressures them the most to be sexually active. 
Does anyone want to take a guess as to who pressures teens the most to be sexually active, according to the teens themselves? Hmm? The media. People are saying the media. So the media was up there on the list. It was third on the list. Number one on the list was their high school health teacher. Because their high school health teachers are normalizing this behavior and saying everyone is doing it. What does every teen want to do? They want to fit in. They want to be normal. So if we tell them that this behavior is normal, guess what? They're going to do it. If we can change the tide, if we can change the conversation and tell them that they are worth the wait, that they deserve to be in a fulfilling relationship that has some emotional bond, not just the physical activity, then they will do that. So the programs need to focus on clear health go goals, have a clear message on the expected behavior, and address the psychosocial risk and protective factors. And that information actually came from Doug Kirby, who very interestingly was the father of condom-based programs in the United States. And he said, programs need to be much more comprehensive in nature. And so those of us who work in sexual health education from an abstinence or a risk avoidance approach really think that our model is far more comprehensive than the so-called comprehensive programs that really just teach kids how to use condoms. So here's what Kirby had to say, who is probably the world-renowned researcher on sex education programs. And again, they developed condom-based programs. And so what he said in doing research on his own programs was that even though our curriculum was designed to reduce unprotected intercourse, so designed to just increase condom use, it clearly had a greater impact on delaying sexual in initiation than on increasing birth control use. So this suggests that it may actually be easier to delay the onset of intercourse than to increase contraceptive practice. Does that surprise anybody? Teens can't remember to do anything. They don't bring a pencil to class, but they're going to remember to have a condom or protection with them when they go to have sex. So let's look at what the national health statistics show us about 15 to 17 year olds, because here's the truth of the matter. So they're being told that everyone does it, but 72% of males in North America aged 15 to 17 have never had sex. Clearly, that's not everybody. 73% of females the same age group have never had sex. When we look at 15 to 19 year olds, it's still the majority, 52% have not had sex, and females 15 to 19, 53 have not had sex. So a minority of teens are engaging in sex. So the CDC proves that by saying that less than 47% of teens have ever had sex. So why do we want to address multiple risky behaviors? Again, because these things cluster. When behaviors cluster, we need to address all of them. And so programs that consistently teach children to make the healthiest choices. We approach all of our programs from what we call a primary prevention model, which means what's in the best health interest of the children. The best health interest of the children, according to the American College of Pediatricians, is to avoid the risks associated with alcohol, tobacco, violence, and sexual activity. We know that children who engage in those behaviors at younger ages are more likely to be addicted. So the goal is to focus on reducing or avoiding the risks in all of those arenas. So what I would say to you is that risk avoidance is a common sense approach. It's much easier because it meets youth where they are. We're going to talk very quickly about the social science behind this, and I'm going to leave about the last eight minutes for your questions. So all of our programs are based on these social cognitive theories, and very quickly, what Erickson says is that we need to look at the identity of youth. Where are they finding their identity? And that's what will drive them to make good decisions. So remember, from the beginning, children said they want both science and they want spiritual reasons for why they should not engage in these behaviors. And so when science gives the same message that faith gives, 
we are in a perfect place to change behavior in our children. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, anybody who's ever taken a basic psychology class knows this, that we need to fulfill needs. And what we teach our children primarily in programs that work in delaying behaviors and changing behaviors for those who are already sexually active to revert to um, a lifestyle of abstinence is we teach self-esteem. So right in there, in that second to last um, box from the top, Self-esteem, confidence, achievement, and respect for others and respect by others. I deserve to be treated well. So we teach goal setting, respect for self, respect for others, and primarily we focus on self-esteem and perceived self-efficacy. So self-esteem is what I think of myself, but self-efficacy is actually more important in decision-making because what that says is I believe that I have the ability to make the healthier choice. No one's going to attempt to quit smoking if they don't think that smoking causes disease, right? So we need that part of it. We need to have a perceived risk. But we also have to believe that we have the inherent ability to change behavior in order to do that. So what determines behavior is whether or not a person believes that they can do something and is willing to change their attitude. So very quickly, the last thing I want to talk about are developmental assets. And someone asked me this morning, what about those children who don't have parents, who don't have faith? How do you change their behaviors? What psychosocial science teaches us is that all we need to do is tip the balance. There are 40 developmental assets that exist in the world, having good support systems, good environment, constructive use of time, a commitment to learning. If they have one more positive, then negative, and we tip the scale towards positive, they have the ability to make healthy choices. So we never have to think that a person is doomed by their socioeconomic status or by their family situation to not be able to learn to make healthy choices, to learn to develop healthy dating relationships, even though, as Dr. Krauss told us in the beginning, most of them never have seen a healthy marriage. Just because you have never seen a healthy marriage doesn't mean you can't have one. I told you earlier, my husband and I have been married for almost 33 years. He did not have any experience with healthy marriage. His parents were divorced. His grandmother had been married five times, okay? And yet he is a committed, devoted husband and father to our adult children and our children by marriage. Because one can choose to use life circumstances to say, this is my lot in life because of where I came from, or we can use the negative experience in our life to say, I'm not going to be like that. I choose to be different, and I deserve to be different. And so when we work with young children, we have to give them that sense that they are worthy of making healthy choices. So I'll reserve the rest of the time for Q&A.